Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Brad Wynn. I'm the site superintendent at the Lewis and Clark State Historic Site. This year, we've been cataloging our 20th anniversary and looking back at some of the stories about the development of the Interpretive Center, our first year of operation. And I am very excited today to have with me Aaron Bishop, who worked with me in our old historic preservation days, Aaron Wright, uh, yeah. Illinois Historic Preservation. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Aaron was responsible for a lot of the development of our exhibits, our stories, where the direction of the building was going to go. And, and stop me if I'm wrong here, Aaron, but a lot of this material that went into developing, and I think, Aaron, our first in-house developed interpretive center, right? We we, mm -hmm. we basically built this from the ground up, right? Yeah. So yeah. Tell, tell me about that process. Where did this story begin? And tell us who you are, Aaron. Okay, yeah, I'm a Springfield, Illinois native. That's where I grew up and um, came back from university. Uh, I did my graduate work in Ireland and came back. And well, before I did that, I had worked for the Lincoln Legal Papers when I got out of college and worked there for three years and then went off to graduate school and then came back and um, landed a job at Historic Preservation Agency uh, because I could read French. Um, and they asked me, can you read 19th century French? And I said, yes, yeah. yes, I can. I didn't know I could. But um, so I did a lot of the French letters for Giraud, specifically the house that they were wanting work done on. So a lot of those sites down in that area that had French connections, Pierre Menard, um, those houses, I got to work on those um, because I could read some of the documents and the letters uh, that existed. Um, so that's how I landed at IHPA. The Lewis and Clark Visitor Center was one of my first really big projects, I guess. And um, I knew absolutely nothing about Lewis and Clark. I literally thought it was like Schoolhouse Rock. It was the two of them in a canoe with Sacagawea, you know, looking out. That was, I had no idea there were more people. Um, I really knew nothing. I was quite stupid um, and kind of bluffed my way through stuff. But so there was a groundswell of, of um, enthusiasm in that region to tell the Illinois story of Lewis and Clark coming up on, up on the uh, bicentennial. And um, people wanted a museum. And there was a lot of talk about a museum. And we at IHPA, the sites division, were like, that's all great, but we don't have anything to put in a museum. You know, usually a museum comes from having a collection. <laughs> and right. we had nothing, you know, the the Missouri Historical Society has everything essentially, you know, so what, how are you gonna have a museum? And the, the communities just really wanted this. It was an opportunity, I suppose, for economic development for the area. Um, but then there were also just Lewis and Clark enthusiasts that really wanted to tell this story. And it is an interesting story. You know, they spent what, six, uh, forgive me, some of my memory is gone, but it was six or eight months or something like that in Illinois yeah. prior to setting out. So um, I think our first dilemma is kind of, historians was what do you how do you build a museum without any artifacts right um but it really you know it, we got word it's going to happen there was enough interest there was enough um political willpower <laughs> there was enough i guess money being thrown at it that it was going to happen and so the next question for the team was how do we how do we do this without any artifacts Right. And um, we finally hit on the idea of a visitor center, not a museum, but a visitor center uh, where you could tell the story. Yeah. Or, or interpretive center. Right, Aaron, that you yeah. were you were interpreting yeah. in, in lieu of artifacts or in lieu of mm -hmm. actual, you know, there, there's no historic building here anymore. Let's interpret right. this history. Yeah. And, and it's not on the site. Right. Either. Right. So that was the other issue is it wasn't on the site, but um, where they camped. Um, so that's where we started. And, um, I think it was Dick Taylor that hit on the idea of a, a film and of some sort of film that could, could tell the story. And I believe it was Donna Lawrence that did the film at New Salem. Right. And that's where Dick Taylor had first worked with her. And she did stuff at the Kentucky Derby Museum that was slides actually but they were rapid fire slides mm -hmm. um, and really interesting stuff that she did. So I I don't recall if we started with her or if we started with Jerry Hilferty and he brought her in. But what we decided was that the, the big key thing in this visitor center, interpreter center was gonna be a film. Okay. Since we didn't really have any artifacts to look at. 
Um, and so there were a couple meetings. So Hilferty was brought in. It was really interesting too. So Hilferty comes in and they were so interesting and creative. We were really excited because normally an exhibit designer comes in and has to force an exhibit into a space. Absolutely. And what we did instead was we literally designed the exhibit and how you would move through the story. And then that was handed to architects to build the building. Absolutely. And that's not normal. No. That's normally, not usual. Yeah. Normally you get a white box, right? And mm -hmm. you just say, okay, what can we cram? How much can we cram? So talk more about that, Aaron, because mm -hmm. you're, you're, there, there's been a lot of, you know, over the years, we've talked about how the building was really built around the exhibits, just as you mentioned. So mm -hmm. what was the importance of that creative flow and kind of what big picture goals were you hoping to be a part of that story? Um, because well, our museum I, tells a story about Illinois, but of course, a story about sites farther west and there's a story about preparation. You, you guys went through some decisions on what story yeah. you wanted to tell. Right. We made a pretty big decision. We weren't going to tell the rest of the story. Yeah. Uh, so we wrap it up really tightly in a few exhibit panels. But the story really is all about Illinois, which had its own challenges. So I think that was a decision that was made is we are not you're not going to get the whole Lewis and Clark story at this center um, necessarily. I mean, you'll you, if this is the only place you ever go, you'll know the Lewis and Clark story when you leave, but it's not going to be in depth. The story is the Illinois story. Um, the other thing that kind of rose to the surface, well, let me go back a little bit. We brought in some big gun historians uh, in to St. Louis area, and we had some major brainstorming meetings where we sat at tables. And I, this is the one thing I loved about this work was those brainstorming sessions, eight hours at a table with these people, great minds talking about these stories. And I remember them starting the conversation with, what do you love about this story? And the historians in the room would say, uh, it's really important that people know that this happened and that this happened. And the exhibit designer is like, no, 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 no. What do you love about this story? We didn't talk facts or history the first day of that charrette. We talked about feelings and emotion. That the story evokes why do so many people love this story um and that was really interesting and the historians were just like this is a disaster people need to be you know and i think it was i'm getting my exhibit designers mixed up but the, the analogy is the same people don't come into a, a museum or an interpretive center with a bucket that you're supposed to fill with knowledge yeah all you have to do is light a spark yeah that's the only thing you have to do. So that when they leave, they buy a book or they watch the next documentary that comes on TV. Right. And they're interested. And then right. they want to go to another museum or they want to, and they'll support you with their tax dollars because right. they had a good emotional connection to the place. Right. Um, so what rose to the surface pretty quickly as far as topics, the importance of the boat, the keel boat, the keel boat just became kind of a centerpiece. And that's, we hit on that idea of what if we did. And so putting that boat in that building drove the shape of the building. Mm -hmm. So the reason, and it, it looks like a prow kind of jutting out. It does. Um, and people, and I remember people didn't like it. And I, I remember we fought hard for that to keep that. Yeah. Um, the director of the agency didn't like it at all. Oh, uh, Susan? Thought it was an ugly building. Yeah, he didn't like it. I remember that. So we kind of had to, there was a little fight about that to keep that, but yeah. I thought it was amazing. And yeah. it was so interesting. And, and, you know, that makes that place really unique, I think, is that that boat drove the architecture of the building right? Um, by having that as a centerpiece. Um, one, of our, one of our, I think our strengths are what we call our core interpretive themes. In other words, these goals, mm -hmm. and you mentioned this a minute ago that, you know, we're, we're, we're not trying to fill this bucket with facts, but we want to make sure that people walk away with a sense of what we want you to remember why this place, we want you mm -hmm. to know what was significant about our Illinois story. And I, I think that was such yeah. a important decision, first of all, to focus exclusively, not exclusively, mm -hmm. But to focus on Illinois, recognizing mm -hmm. perhaps that we're a part of a national trail. Right. So we want to give you everything that you can so you can kind of encapsulate the story, but yeah. we'll pass the baton on. But tell me about your recollections on developing these themes because you you've got to whittle down. I'm sure there was a board that started with all the things you want people to know, and you eventually worked it down 
to key mm-hmm. concepts that you wanted people. So, you know, I, I don't want to test your memory so much, Aaron, but to, no. to talk about that development. Yeah, I do remember there was an exercise at one point was uh, tell me 10 things. Was it 10? They gave us a number. What are the 10 most important things people need to know when they leave? And the, the historians yeah. are going bonkers. Maybe yeah. it was 30 initially. Yeah. I don't know. So then everybody put their things in a hat, you know, then we had all of them. So there's 10, you know, we had a hundred things. And then he's like, we're going to whittle this down to 10. I think that was what, you know, I think maybe we started yeah. at 30 and then we had to yeah. come up with 10. Yeah. And I don't really remember what they were, but you know, there were just important things that they wanted people to know. And, um, but the, the theme that we really hit on, and this was all Donna Lawrence, like pulling this out of us. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I don't want to take a lot of credit, but I kind of feel like it, it was my idea. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that, that sounds terrible. Um, but for me, the story was, the, the most exceptional part of the story was ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And the idea that sitting in Illinois, they were just standing on the edge of the unknown. Yeah. And we've all been there. So we can't say we've all, you know, given up their families and moved, you know, gone in a canoe and went west, you know, but we have all been in a situation where we're standing on the edge. You know, you're standing at the, the, in the church waiting to walk down the aisle. Yeah. You know, you're standing outside the door of the university. You're standing outside the door of your first job. Um, you know, there, there are all, all these milestones in our lives where you're standing on the edge and you're anticipating what it's going to be. And uh, she called it the beautiful terror. So there's all this excitement, but there's also this, you know, you're a little nervous about the whole thing. Yeah. And yeah. that kind of came the hook to hang on that anybody that walks in this visitor center can grasp that idea, has experienced that idea. And that's your connection. We struggle a lot with, you know, how do you connect with little girls? There's no girls in this story. Um, How do we connect with women? And, you know, the historians were all guys and they wanted to talk about the mechanics of the boat and how much gunpowder they had. And, you know, it's boring. (laughs) How do you tell this story in a way that captures people's imagination? Well, Aaron, um, talk about that because you, I would imagine you had to fight because, and one of the things that I think sets our museum apart is how early and progressive it was 20, mm-hmm. 25 years ago, Aaron. I mean, we're, we're telling the story of the washerwoman, right? We're mm-hmm. telling the story mm-hmm. of those individuals who had a role in the expedition that weren't maybe necessarily on it, but the mm-hmm. small population that were here. We're telling the story of York and, you know, this was before the bicentennial and the real focus on the people that were beyond just simply Lewis and Clark, you mentioned earlier Mm -hmm. when we were kids, it was two guys in a canoe and there happened to be a woman in the front. But as you found out, this was an expedition of 40 plus individuals. Mm -hmm. And the role eventually, even here of some of the American Indian, you know, involvement, Mm -hmm. success, or even early preparations for the expedition. So tell us about that process of of making the case beyond just simply the technical aspect of the boat, but Tell yeah. the of, of, of the individuals beyond just simply Lewis and Clark, the whole expedition. Right. There's two things there I think that could be kind of interesting is I, prior to taking that job, I had done some adjuncting and I had taught a couple civil rights courses. Mm-hmm. So I think I was aware of um, the importance of African-American history and, and telling that story as I came in. But also my doctorate was in 19th century women. Okay. Um, so I was coming into it with a little bit more of a feminist lens, mm-hmm. I think, and looking for that story and what that interest was. And yeah, we fought, there was some fighting going on. Um, but, you know, I had to fight to get the washerwoman in. And when the exhibit designers came back with the first uh, uh, exhibit panel text, it yep. was something like, you know, there was a washerwoman she used lye soap to clean the laundry. Lye soap is made up of, like, yeah. you know, whatever's yeah. in lye soap. And I was like, what the hell? Are you kidding yeah. me? Yeah, right. <laughs> it's like we're talking about soap, <laughs> you know. So um, that you was, you know. Down to that. soap, right. Yeah. I was like, you just took this woman who's making a living for her family. She's a wit- probably a widow mm-hmm. trying, you know, and she sees this opportunity to step in, this was a godsend for her to come in and be able to do these guys' laundry and make some money. Um, I argued um, to tell the story of syphilis and disease that, that you know, these guys were sick and they spread it. Right. Um, 
and and that there were you know we had a lot of conversation about the the women hanging out around the camp um camp followers you know that were there also to make money um and how could we tell that get that story in there yeah. um the other thing i found super interesting was to talk find out as much as we could about these individuals uh, they were married some of them yeah some of them were married men with children and they left them to do this not knowing if they'd come back i mean right. that's that's something you can really grasp onto that's not a technical it's more of a social thing i think so i think i did come at it with that lens a little bit um and so we did we did have the fight about um how much syphilis medication that they took on the trip and that was <laughs> up to, i don't know if you want me to get into that no story. well you know we can edit if we need to but yeah yeah but that was um they came back with um because they took a penis syringe on yeah. the boat and so they came back and they were going to have one Scary. It's it's medieval and how big it is. Yeah. And you know, and they oh, and this will give you so the text was um this is a penis syringe. It's used to treat syphilis. Men contract syphilis from having sex with women. Really? That's what the original text came back? Yeah. Did you just did you just go, you know, I mean who who writes that? From <laughs> that's yeah. it. Say that again, Aaron. Say that again. Where did the women catch it from? Did they just manifest syphilis? Like, I. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Everybody was like, oh, I can just imagine all these little kids from St. Mary's Catholic School and wherever it is nearby, you know, standing there looking at this thing and the nun trying to explain it. So I don't think the penis syringe made it in, but no. we did put a lot of in the quote section. And I think the quotes area is where we sort of told the rest of the story through quotes from the journals. We made sure there were story that there were quotes in there about how these men were sick and how they were spreading the disease. Yeah, and you know they weren't all saints, and and a lot of the historians at the table didn't want to tell those stories. These are heroes, and but what makes them more relatable is they were ordinary people with flaws. And if you're coming into that place and you're an ordinary person with a flaw, that's inspiring. That's something you can relate to, and. That's what I love about the story. Yeah. So tell me about that, Aaron, because one of the things that I think was a smart decision was you 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 mentioned this a minute ago. There are a lot of quotes in in the mm -hmm. media. They're not cleaned up, right? There's misspellings. There's mm -hmm. there's phonetic spelling. They were spelling as they were as they were speaking. It, it adds a human quality to it, and the inter the interactivity of the exhibits. There's a lot of, and it's not digital. It's not technology interactivity, Aaron. I mean, there's a lot. Would you, it's almost like, would you like to know more? I mean, flip this panel, look at this. Did you, how involved were you in that decision to make the museum relatable, not only interactively, but relatable more so again with this human element to the story? Yeah, and I don't remember who or how we hit upon the idea of quoting the journals exactly. I remember it was a real job to edit that and make sure it was correct. We literally... And I believe it was Mark Johnson and I sat and read it out loud. I think we spelled it. So one of us had the journal and the other one had the text. And I think we spelled it to check it yeah. out loud. Yeah. Uh, to make sure it was right. So that it was a lot of energy went into those labels and making sure they were correct. I think the interactivity came from it could have been Hilferty, it could have been Dick Taylor talking about how I think at any one time. 20% of a museum's interactive displays are not functioning. Mm -hmm. And knowing we were, and I think that quote, I think that percentage is right. I could be wrong, but it's, it's a high enough percentage that if you're a small historic site on a state budget, that is not something you want. You know, you don't want a lot of high tech gadgetry that is not going to be working most of the time. You're not going to be able to replace it. You, right. you don't get money. You know, I always say like politicians don't come to cut ribbons for a replacement part. <laughs> You know, so you're not going to get the funding for it. Um, so, yeah, so I think there was definitely a decision made to have interactivity, but keep it really um, analog, you know. Yeah, I'm grateful yeah. today for that because it means mm -hmm. you don't have to go to replacing right. technology that's going to be outdated in, in five years. Right. So the other great thing we did was we uh, hired an artist. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, because we didn't have artifacts. We, you know, we got an artist to come and do some just amazing illustrations uh, that also humanized it, I think, because you have these great images of these individuals, I think. Yeah, yeah. 
So Aaron, mm -hmm. tell me a little bit more about, was you said this was one of your first projects that you really worked mm -hmm. the lead on this and these meetings that you talked about with these historians was, tell me about the importance for you and your job about this. Like you, you were handed this large project and, and I, I bring this up, Aaron, because in some ways, I think it was relatable. You and I were probably just getting our career started. I remember mm -hmm. I was brought in, the building was under construction, but suddenly I was being thrust into a situation where I had an $8 million project that I was responsible for kind of foreseeing or seeing through to the finish. You had already done your hard work, but yet mm -hmm. yeah. presence, that story making, I mean, I wasn't involved in any of that. So tell me about your early career, kind of getting involved in this big project ahead of the bicentennial. And then what is what is something you're really most proud of as a takeaway from this project? I didn't know anything, you know. I mean, and I'm sitting at the table with some of these top Lewis and Clark scholars, and I hardly knew anything. Mm -hmm. um, so the the fear and the trying to get in there and do the research, I think what I sort of learned is, you know, when you come out with a master's degree or doctorate in history, you have a skill set to know how to get the answers and to figure it out and to figure it out quickly. You know, so I was able to go in and and get that background information so I, I could understand it um, better. What am I most proud of? Some of the stuff we did later, I think, like the work I did with Cindy on the um, we did a little educational pamphlet for teachers. Yeah. And then we did um, some traveling trunks that would we would share with other historic sites. And then we did an exhibit um, and it was a collaborative event between multiple historical sites yep. in that region. And the fact that we all worked together to create these things that we could all use um, and, and working with the people there, I think, was some of the best part of it, you know. Um, so I think that would be. And I, I yeah, so. I guess that's one thing I'm really proud of was later, you know, the interpretive stuff that we did and the educational stuff that we did. I mean, I think I also am kind of, I do feel like I, I helped in getting some of the story told in such a way that was a little more, more um, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? You know, just a little more interesting or a little more accessible, I guess is the word to other people. And that we really did try to avoid kind of that great white man story, which it really, could have very easily devolved into, especially given the people that were at the table, honestly. You know, it was a lot of male historians who love that story of the great American man who's, you know, made America. And that get telling the other story, I think, was important too. But I, again, and I, not to take away from anything these guys did, they were great American men, but I think they were, what is, again, what is extraordinary is how ordinary they were. And it was they they weren't they didn't exist in a vacuum. They they needed assistance mm -hmm. from from everyone. Right. I think what's extraordinary to me, and I mentioned this to you earlier, Aaron, of, of how forward you were on that thinking. That's what we talk about mm -hmm. today. Contribution. Yeah. So you were fighting that fight when the bison mm -hmm. was coming forward, but you and a lot of other people had to fight hard to make sure that the story was being told. Not again, not to ignore what their contribute contribution was, but the story mm -hmm. was being to its fullest degree in other words let's look beyond just simply the story of these guys let's look at the story mm -hmm. beyond some of that or, or behind some of that so yeah um, and let's look at the difficult things that are you know the difficult parts of the story here right. um that that would be how women were treated or how slaves were treated or the how the native American the impact on the native americans um right. And those are hard things to talk about. And there's the tendency to want to know this is, a, I mean, I can remember even hearing this is a celebration. And I think we got rid of that word. It's a commemoration. Right. It's not a celebration because there's a large segment of the population that didn't view it as, as anything to celebrate. Right. Um, so, and, and what I also think, and I think this across the board, not just on this project, but we underestimate the intelligence of our visitors and their interest in getting into that nitty gritty stuff. Yeah, I don't think they want the glossy stuff. I think they like the messy stuff. And I think they're willing to put the time in to understand that. And I think they can see if you're trying to avoid uncomfortable subjects, mm -hmm. whatever, mm -hmm. you lose credibility with your guests, with your visitors, if you either refuse to talk about it, if you dismiss mm -hmm. it outright, or if you just flat out lie, they're going to see through that. Yeah. Perfectly, and then you've lost any any uh, relationship or rapport that you may have developed with them, you know, from the very beginning or goodwill for that matter. Right. And and when you don't know an answer, you tell them. And and oftentimes we 
can give them a lot of scenarios. Some historians think this, some historians think that. What do you think? What makes sense to you? No, we do that. I, I think very much mm -hmm. from the, that early work that you did. Do you remember, Aaron, you talked about one of the things that you said after the fact. You remember coming to me about when we developed the brochure for this place. You didn't want to go through the two color, the normal gray and and one color thing. Like you really wanted to punch up our brochure. So the, the mm -hmm. thing, but I'm crediting you, the thing that we developed was this really high color, really dynamic brochure that was unlike any other brochure for any other state historic site that we had. We were... You know, we were breaking the barrier of like, how much color can we have in this thing? You know, we worked with Dave Blend, yeah. some good photographs done to do a real history that made the brochure not just something that you would get like, here is the bathrooms and here's your hour. I mean, it was really a fantastic brochure. Well, um, I forgot that, but I just had such an aversion to sepia. I just, <laughs> it's like I forbid the use of sepia. You know, if it's history, it has to be brown. I don't, that was always the thing. Like, and a lot of that I think came out of the whole park service mentality because the park service was so integral to to create, you know, to the science of interpretive, right? You know, history. So I think that was part of it. That kind of the brown and green <laughs> right. and mustard colors. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe. <laughs> so. Well, Aaron, I, you know, I, I hope this museum still stands as a part of your portfolio, the, a part of your life that was, you know, that's something you're very proud of. And, you, know, you know, when you get a chance to come back or even today thinking about it, I hope it's something that you felt was was, you know, certainly worth the challenge, but rewarding in the sense that, it, you know, what you were able to help set was the stage for, I, you know, a lot of we've had well over a million plus visitors here over the years. I know we're one of the top ranked museums on the, or not a museum, sorry, interpretive centers on the national trip. <laughs> but people who have come here are are so complimentary. And I think you, you mm -hmm. deserve a lot of that work, Aaron, for making this museum so um, approachable, so easy to kind of follow. We, you know, we appeal to the people who want to just come and learn a little bit. And we appeal to the Clarkies that come in here and really want to get down into the, to the real depth mm -hmm. of the and it stood the test of time. We have, we have, I think, been ahead of the curve. And I think that's a large in part to your contribution and your your input on the museum. So I want to thank you for coming in and sitting with me today. Thanks. Is there anything else you want to add? Just one last memory that you remember? Did I was just going to say, it, it's been really fun to kind of walk down memory lane. I hadn't thought about it in a while. So, you know, it's been kind of fun. And, and I guess it is something to be really proud of. I hadn't really thought about it. I definitely think it was a team effort. Right. Um, I think Hilford and associates were amazing and brought a lot to the table and of course Donna Lawrence with her film and, and everything and um, I just yeah it's a great place you've been a great director that's been helpful too to have young blood as well like right. you were young and I think that was a good thing um, you probably had no idea what you're getting yourself into but <laughs> but um, it was a good project and I do I think the one thing I could say I knew about that time in my life were those really engaging, in-depth, thoughtful, thought-provoking conversations about history. Um, and I don't get to do that anymore. Right. What a great room to be in, to be a part of that. And, and just thinking mm -hmm. school, like, wow, I'm in this room with all these historical minds and we're talking mm -hmm. about this passionate subject that we're all, you know, and whatever, you know, the, the sharing of ideas and such. So anyway. yeah. And then when you say something and everyone goes, oh, yeah, but look at that feeling of like, oh, okay, like my idea. You know, that was always great, too, because we were young. Right. Uh, so, you know, it was nice to feel validated, like maybe I did deserve a place at the table, even though a lot of times I think I felt like a fraud. <laughs> when the, you call it imposter, imposter syndrome. <laughs> yeah, right. no, absolutely. Should I really be here? Am I ready for this and all that? And then hit, yeah. hit the bicentennial a year later. So that was crazy. Where that was insane. I was very pregnant. During the bicentennial, yes, at that event, and down and help mm -hmm. that that washout bicentennial event. I think you came down with a lot of our HPA staff yeah. for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if I was like super showing, but I was pretty pregnant because I remember having to crawl under a table and somebody yelling at me. Oh no! Be <laughs> <laughs> doing that. <laughs> but that was a wild day for sure. I remember that. Absolutely insane. So we're that's next year's uh, recollection. So we may invite you back. Yeah. Remember those? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This is really fun. Great seeing you.